70% of the pollutants coming into the bay. <coughs> and so the pollutants that we're going to be talking about are nitrogen, well, okay, so we have two categories here. We have sediment coming off the land, which is illustrated here in this bottom picture. Everybody knows when you get really heavy rains, the Susquehanna River turns to chocolate milk. Um, and that chocolate milk is really um, sort of, there's sediment particles or different sizes of sand, cobble, um, silt, clay that are washing off of our land. And a lot of that's coming from farm fields. It's coming from our streets. It's coming from barnyard areas. And so it's, you get those heavy rains, everything that's kind of loose on the landscape is gonna be transported in the water. And sediment is a big issue when it enters all, all sizes of streams. You can think about something locally like Buffalo Creek. Um, we want the, the bottom surface of our creek to have those nice cobbles and things that fish are using to breed in, that macroinvertebrates or those insects living in the stream can hide under. When that's uh, smothered out by sediment, you get loss of those macroinvertebrates. And if the fish don't have food, they can't survive there either. So having sediment entering our waterways is a really big issue. The other pollutant that we have coming from the Susquehanna uh, is nut our nutrients. And the main two nutrients here are going to be nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and these are sort of limiting in aquatic systems. You can sort of think of them as like plant and algae food. They're limiting in most cases when you get big rushes of nutrients in, you're gonna have algal blooms and you're gonna have a lot of plant matter being produced. But the real issue there is what happens when you run out of food. The algae start to die, the plants start to die, and microbes are gonna start eating it. And you can see here, um, this is an algal bloom that occurred in part of the, up, the upper part of the Chesapeake Bay. And what you have um, when all those microbes are eating that dead material, you deplete all of your oxygen out of the system. The fish die, the macroinvertebrates die, you kill off almost the entire community in those areas. And this can have widespread impacts. I mean, portions of the bay, you can have 20 square miles that's completely dead uh, as a result of these, these anoxic zones or, and the nutrient pollution. So these are the two issues that we're trying to address. I talked briefly sort of about where they're coming from. And there are three main sectors that you can break this down into as sort of where we see the issues coming from. First, we have wastewater here. So all of the human waste that we produce goes to wastewater treatment plants or to your septic system. Wastewater treatment plants are actually required to remove a lot of the nutrients and sediment from that waste. However, they can leave some of it in there, and that's actually being di discharged right into our surface water streams. Uh, Stormwater, when you think of large rain events, uh, think about water hitting the pavement out on the road here. All of that stormwater runoff is picking up you know, oil, all types of things from your cars, it's picking up pet waste that people haven't picked up. Anything that's really there um, is washing right into these catch basins that everybody sees along the streets. Those catch basins aren't going to a sewage treatment facility or a wastewater treatment facility. Um, they're headed right for our streams. So that stuff's not being filtered out. And then lastly, we have agriculture as the last class of sort of pollution issues. And here you can see we have livestock unexcluded from a lot of streams in Pennsylvania. Um, this is an issue for both nutrients. You can see the cow going to the bathroom in that top picture and also a sedimentation issue. I mean, they're picking up uh, and putting a lot of different types of sediment into the stream here, and they're kind of turning it into chocolate milk downstream of where they are. We also have runoff from crop fields. Um, if you think of a farmer applying um, manure to their fields and it rains the next day, the farmer's losing all of that sort of added benefit to his fields. It's not gonna help his crops grow as much. Um, and that pollution is actually entering our waterways and going downstream to help different algae and plants grow. Um, and so Pennsylvania has really, I set this up in terms of how Pennsylvania has tried to address these issues. We've gone through three phases of what we call watershed implementation planning that's sort of organized at the state level but is really like a local um, action plan for how we can address uh, nutrient and sediment pollution. The first uh, plan came out in 2010 and really focused on cleaning up wastewater. So that was the first place we worked. We upgraded a lot of our treatment plants to reduce sediment and nutrients. Um, 
came up with different filtering systems, that sort of thing. So that was phase one. We cleaned up a lot of pollution that way. The second thing we did was looked at stormwater. Can you redirect some of this uh, stormwater runoff from our streets into retention swales? Think about plantings alongside the streams. Can you run that water in there and have nature help you filter it out, hold the pollutants back and push the clean water into your streams and rivers? Um, so that was phase two. We looked at stormwater issues. And now Pennsylvania is really starting this process to look at how we can address agricultural issues. How can you work with the farming community um, to you know, implement management practices that are benefiting not only the environment, but also the economics on a farm? And so here I have a list of different management practices that can be installed on farms. Uh, they range from something like a nutrient management plan, how they're applying their manure or other types of fertilizers, like the timing of that, how much they're applying, looking at no-till farming or using cover crops is on here, uh, implementing barnyard management, uh, so how they're rotating their livestock through different fields on their farm. And then we also have these plantings listed on here. There's a forest riparian buffer or streamside tree plantings. And then we also have grass buffers listed. And I'm gonna highlight the forest riparian buffer one, excuse me, these tree plantings along streams. Uh, and look at the pink bar is showing nitrogen removal efficiency. So how good is that practice at pulling uh, nitrogen out of the system? And you can see that forest riparian buffer plantings are by far the best investment if you're looking to reduce nutrients. And when you actually look at the cost benefit analysis, forest riparian buffers, again, come up the same way. Very, very effective um, in terms of how much you're actually investing in the practice and how far it's getting you in terms of nutrient and sediment reductions. So forest riparian buffers are these streamside tree plantings, plantings of trees, shrubs, and grasses along our waterways. I've got sort of an aerial image up here of what a forest riparian buffer looks like from the sky. And what this is supposed to do, I'm gonna walk you through sort of how this works from like a, a zone perspective. When you talk about forest riparian buffers, we design these with three zones in mind. Zone three is your outermost zone away from the stream. It's gonna be right next to whatever adjoining land use you have. So say it's next to a farm field. In zone three, we're planting a lot of grasses and shrubs, and they're meant to help slow down your runoff um, that's carrying pollutants as you approach the stream. The next zone you're gonna to come to, zone two, contains a lot of trees and shrubs. Uh, and what this is supposed to do is, as you're slowing down that runoff, you want it to actually soak into the ground. You want that sediment to fall out onto whatever vegetation you have, and you want the runoff containing the nutrients to soak into the ground, because the trees can pull those nutrients out and use them for growth. And then zone one, closest to the stream, that's a planting of a lot of smaller shrubs and some trees, and this zone is really meant to help hold your banks in place stabilize a lot of that sediment and hold it back. And then one of the thing, one of the added benefits of these tree plantings along streams is what it's doing for the trout populations. So Stroud Water Research Center actually had a program a few years ago asking students, elementary school students, to depict the benefits of buffers. And they came out of this with, this picture is called Trout Grow on Trees. Um, I really like it, I think it's cute. Um, and so it, there's a lot of truth in that. When you have these native trees along your streams, the leaves that are falling in there are actually the food for a lot of the bugs that live in streams. So think about things like mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, the important trout foods that they need those native leaves to be able to survive in your stream. So you can't have trout if you don't have the leaves there. Um, so buffers provide a lot of water quality benefits, but they also have these co-benefits for wildlife as well. And you can